Northwoods League and also the Ontario Blue uh, Junior Blue Jays. And Tom Rominski, MLB with the score uh, editor. How is everybody today? Doing great, Doing great. you know, just uh, another uh, great day in March. It looks like uh, the weather is finally turning around and uh, the dog days of winter might be behind us, but I'm, I'm sure we're in for a few more snowy days. I'm sure in the Sioux, it's still awfully chilly, but. <laughs> and that's exactly it, right, Tony? They, they, can, they, can, they can play baseball soon, we can't. That's right, they know. <laughs> so, yeah, so I really appreciate Appreciate you guys coming on, especially you, Mike. I know you guys are busy with, uh, you know, spring training going on and, and Tom, especially you. So I really appreciate you doing this. What we want to talk about with you, Tom, is kind of just to start off, kind of your path and your journey to where you are today. I mean, you know, you everyone hears that, you know, you get to, you're a, big, a baseball editor for the score and obviously, you know, big sports fans just think that's the dream job and think that's the best job on earth. So I kind of want to talk about how you got there. So can you kind of talk about, you know, your your where you went to university and kind of your journey to become where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, just like uh, getting to the majors while you're uh, playing in the minors, it's uh, quite the journey and, and it's a, a total grind. Um, I started off my career as a intern for sportsnet.ca. And that was uh, almost 10 years ago, actually. I was uh, thinking about it today, being like, wow, where did the time even go, right? So, and after uh, working for uh, .ca for a year, ended up, uh, my contract wasn't renewed and I was talking to a uh, former uh, journalism instructor of mine. So uh, prior to Sportsnet.ca, I went to uh, Centennial College for their post-grad uh, sports journalism program. And this is after I uh, went to uh, Wilfrid Laurier, so I, I got a, a degree from there. But uh, anyways, so uh, w one of my uh, old instructors was like, hey man, there's a uh, opening to be a uh, sports director in a uh, radio station in Yellowknife. Uh, I was like, okay, uh, at this point, uh, I'm like not even 25. Uh, all I have is like a, a gym membership. I still live with my mom. Uh, that, that's That's pretty much like, you know, me in a nutshell at this point. So like, what's the worst thing that can happen? So yeah, I jump on an airplane and I go to the subarctic to live in the Northwest Territories. And I'm, I'm there for uh, seven months, which was uh, pretty cool. Yeah. Some uh, experiences, of course. Um, I, I do remember the first time I, I landed in Yellowknife and over the course of the first couple of days, I was just like, oh my my God, what am I doing here? I went front out to this like tiny little town. Uh, everything is super fresh and super new, but the people were very welcoming at the first radio station that I worked for. We called it Little Ontario, which was kind of strange because everybody that worked at uh, the station and wasn't actually from Yellowknife or the Northwest Territories. So, and then um, I uh, unfortunately got uh, laid off uh, after about seven months. And then, uh, I, I was like, you know, what am I going to do now? I, I, this, if there's like a bucket list, I imagine that being laid off in yellow knife might be on like the anti bucket list or something. So <laughs> I, I was freaking out a little bit. Um, yeah. and I decided to come back to Toronto and uh, after about a month in Toronto, uh, the same company that laid me off, hired me back and I decided to go to Vancouver Island, which is literally like a complete, you know, opposite of Yellowknife. I went from one of the coldest places in Canada to basically like the Hawaii of Canada, um, <laughs> which was super yeah. cool. So then I spent uh, two years working for uh, several different uh, radio stations um, on Vancouver Island, pretty much jack of all trades, doing everything, reporting, anchoring, uh, hosting my own radio show. And then after two years were done at that point, uh, I, you know, born and raised in Toronto, I've always been a big city guy. So I felt that, Hey, this is, uh, th this is the right time to kind of go back to, uh, the, the big city. I feel like the, the old adage, like you got to take one step back to take two steps forward is definitely something that a lot of young journalists should try to do escape, uh, out of your comfort zone and, and that's how you kind of uh, learn um, a lot of things that you're really not going to have a chance to do 
in some of the larger uh, publications. So once I came back to Toronto, I spent uh, three years working for uh, Sportsnet 590, The Fan, and 680 News, uh, doing a whole bunch of stuff there, uh, production, uh, freelance reporting, editing, uh, technical production. I worked on like Leafs broadcast, Raptors broadcast, Blue Jays broadcast. And then finally, uh, a job at the score opened up as a uh, MLB writer slash editor and baseball has always been my thing. So I jumped on that and uh, I, I've been there for over two years now. And like I was saying, just looking back at the whole kind of collective body of work. I was like, man, where did like 10 years go? Because yeah, yeah it's, it's, it goes by quick, but uh, it's, it's a pretty wild ride. So. Sorry, Mike. I think these guys are still babies when it comes to age though. I tell you what, I was just thinking that Tom said 10 years and I'm like, Holy crap. If you ask me my question, I think it might go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that's great. So Tom, so talk us through um, a typical work, day or a typical work week for you during the season? Um, I'm, I'm just going to make the assumption that in season is busier than off season for you. So, you know, what is your, what does a typical day look like for a, for a sports editor? And, uh, and just talk us through a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Oh, can't hear. No, we can't, we can't, we lost. Yeah. <laughs> Technical difficulties. While we're waiting, Mike, can you talk a little bit about your background so we can get Tom back in? Um, yeah, I can uh, definitely kill some airtime here with that. I think, uh, you know, like Tom, I, I think going through the journey, um, you know, I'm fortunate to be in my 28th year right now of coaching. Uh, and, you know, growing up in Burlington, Ontario, you know, Southern Ontario kid, I was fortunate to to go to the United States and, and, and play collegiate baseball and, uh, you know, uh, pitching in Northeastern Oklahoma and at the junior college level and, you know, moving on Northeastern state, uh, as a very average college pitcher, um, you know, left hand, just, uh, through, through strikes did that. And I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, I enjoyed the, as a youngster, I enjoyed the game through college and was fortunate enough that when, you know, they told me I was done playing, uh, at a high level, um, you know, I was able to get my first job back at uh, Northeastern Oklahoma and m you know, way back in 1993-94 and, uh, you know, stayed there for three, four years, uh, moved back from Oklahoma, actually worked for the Toronto Blue Jays with their camps, uh, their youth camps when I got back in the late 90s and uh, ran an amateur team in the Toronto area called the GTA Stars, um, you know, same 18 and under high school players, um, did that for three years and had the opportunity to go back to the States, um, after managing in a semi pro league in Wisconsin, uh, I got the pitching coach's job at Concordia university, Ann Arbor in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, so I was there. That's, for, that's where you went to university, wasn't it? I didn't go there. No, I, just, no? I, I went to both in Oklahoma oh, sorry. Both places and then, uh, took that job. Um, Stayed there, was at Madonna for a year in Michigan. So I was in Michigan for five years. And then, uh, again, single guy moving around, had an opportunity to come back to the, the Burlington, Ontario area where, you know, family is and uh, got back into the amateur business um, with some, you know, elite level development teams in Oakville and then uh, moved up to Thunder Bay in 09, 10 and 11, managed the Border Cats for my first stint in the Northwoods league, um, came back here and was, was hired by, uh, you know, my current team, I work for an employer, the Ontario blue Jays, uh, you know, another high development team. And, uh, just recently, two years ago, uh, I decided, to, the border cat organization called me and said they were looking for a manager. And, um, you know, through my wife and me, we talked about it and the blue Jays were great, you know, worked well with me, allowed me to do both. Um, with them in the fall and winter and then uh, managing the Northwoods League and hopefully, you know, come 2022 when things get back to normal, uh, you know, we'll get going back in that league, which, uh, you know, is something I really enjoy. You guys just canceled your season, right? The, yeah, unfortunately, due to the uncertainty of the border restrictions and the quarantine and then, you know, the limited outdoor gatherings, 
the league got to a point where we had to make a decision being a 22 team league. And if we waited too long and then come closer to May, we, uh, you know, we couldn't cross the border. There was still quarantine. It would have just, you can imagine the intricacy and Tom knows by being around baseball in the minor leagues, when you have 22 teams spaced out over five different States, you know, the schedule's not easily reworked uh, in that yeah. case. So the, the border cats are on pause again in 22 and uh, our roster will be dispersed in a dispersal draft throughout the league. And that trickles um, up to you, to the major leagues right there, Tom. Uh, it would, in terms of uh, how uh, minor leagues are basically impacted by the pandemic or. Yeah. And then it yeah. affects the, affects the pros too, right? Yes. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, even uh, you're seeing now uh, for major league camps, uh, MILB baseball was supposed to start in April. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, you know, uh, Rob Manfred comes out and, and says that, hey, we're going to actually delay the start of the minor league baseball season for a month uh, to basically make sure that safety protocols are in place and that players have the opportunity to get vaccinated. And then all of a sudden you have prospects that are going to be uh, in alternate camps, which is something very similar to what you saw last season with the with the 60 game campaign. So I, I do find it fascinating that all of a sudden the, the pros, hey, it's OK to go and play baseball. But for, for the minor leaguers that are making almost nothing, you got to wait for another month because of health and safety protocols. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. 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 so, so Oh, that's good. So, Tom, this is what I was asking before. Uh, uh, yeah, before you got uh, cut that. off Technolo there, but technology. Oh no, that's my one, right? So, <laughs> I know, I know. So, uh, you, you would think uh, we would you know, have being a, being a sport already. So, <laughs> oh yeah. So, being being a huge uh, sports fan, you know, a lot of people look at your job and just think, you know, it, we talked a little bit about it about what a job it would be for a lot of people. But can you talk of what an average day or week looks like for you during the season yeah so i mean uh the off season like it's it's it could definitely be one of those uh situations where it's like zero to 100 real quick um so i got like tweak deck set up um i'm looking at all my other sources whether it's uh espn mlb.com uh checking if different stories are getting dropped but for the most part um we follow all the mlb beat reporters uh, the different teams, all of the uh, national insiders to uh, see if they're going to be uh, tweeting out if any sort of news is breaking. And and something can be very slow developing, like you see it from a mile away. Uh, for example, like the, the George Springer stuff, there's so many leaks and you're kind of just like the excitement is building and and you're getting ready to, you know, drop a post. Uh, we, we call it an MTC where it's, you know, you get... Uh, uh, one line out basically with what happens and then you source the reporter and then we come up with like an, an alert as well that we're, we're going to send out to the users of a certain like fan base and then we just wait for the confirmation to you know from from one of the big guys and and, and we go with that but there can also be situations where out of the blue fernando tatis jr signs like a 13-year mammoth extension and everyone's just like oh my god and this just happens all of a sudden and you really gotta you know you gotta be like cool calm and collective uh take a deep breath and basically make sure that the facts are right make sure that everything is packaged tight together for sending that alert to the users because once it's out there, it's, you know, it, it, you're not really coming back from that. Like the, the worst thing is possibly like sending out a correction, like, it, like the, the alerts, especially for uh, a company like the score, obviously that that's like the face of our brand. Right. So we really have to be very polished when it comes to that. Um, so with the off season, it can really be hit or miss sometimes. Uh, and then, once uh, the regular season is going, we obviously deal with uh, a, a ton of video highlights. Again, uh, if I would be going to the office, one of the coolest parts of working at the score, we have something called the war room, where we have about 10 TVs on simultaneously with, with uh -huh. baseball games. So it's like, yeah, if, if, if you're a, like a monster sports fan and somebody gives you 10 TVs with, with different games on, then uh, who says no to that, right? And in addition yeah. to that, get our own personal TVs, multiple monitors, and it's really just about being on top of a situation. And 
some stories can be super easy, excuse me, and other stories are tough legal stories where you, where you really got to go through them with uh, with with a lot of uh, you know uh, attention. And we work uh, a lot with our copy team as well. So anything that's ultimately submitted before it goes live on the app. It actually has to go through a set of copy editors and we go back and forth. There's a lot of dialogue. There's like, we have baseball yeah. chats as well, where all the, the writers and the editors have to, you know, have discussions about, should we write this post? Shouldn't we, what, what should we be looking for? And it, uh, for example, a day like today, super slow, wrote up one story about Joey Votto getting COVID-19. Uh, hopefully it gets better soon. And then there can be another day where I'm writing like seven stories in eight hours. And I'm just like, I have a list and I just prioritize. And then out of nowhere, massive like trader signing drops. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to write these five other stories another time. So like, yeah. <laughs> just got to go through that. And we, we have different features as well. Power rankings, listicles, takeaways. So we, we really just divide and conquer in terms of our work and, and just go from there. But yeah, I, I think the coolest thing when I, you know, went to the score was definitely getting all those TVs for all our sports. And, yeah. and obviously yeah. it, it's, it's great being in the newsroom when something super electric happens because collectively, yeah, we're writing about different things in different sports, but when something truly incredible happens, it's like, you can just feel the buzz in the newsroom, which is kind of what I miss working from home at, at, at this point in time. Right. What is there a story that, you specifically had a major hand in breaking or you know is there a was there a sign or have you ever had that happen where you were the one that could break any news uh in terms of major, in terms of baseball or just, yeah in, in terms of the score or just major league baseball in general yeah yeah so i mean uh i some of the biggest uh stories that i worked on uh trevor bauer getting traded to uh, the Cincinnati Reds for Yasiel Puig. That yeah. was a big one. Uh, I wrote up the uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. extension uh, a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah. um, it, it's funny because the biggest story that I've ever written for the score was uh, last March when the NBA decided to suspend its season after Rudy Gobert tested positive for COVID, um, I've I've only I've only written two base uh, excuse me two basketball stories in my entire life, and one of them was that one, and they were just they were just so slammed that I had to you know yeah. jump in and help them out because we're all sports writers like we we can obviously just uh, on a dime we could just uh change up what we're writing about so that was super cool i mean i think that story ended up doing like a, a half a million views in like 24 hours or something like that wow. so yeah. that's crazy so before we get into the blue jays which we're going to get into here next your and mike's take on this so you know you mentioned the fernando tatis jr deal one thing that fascinated me about that deal more than anything and i never even heard of this company before of this um uh big league advance company and i'm sure tom you've heard with, with it, they're a company that's out there who 18 you know 17 18 19 year olds a large portion of money but in return they have to give up for tatis it was eight percent of his all future earnings so i think mm -hmm. the story was he got something like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars when he was you know 18 and now he's on the hook for 23 million or 26 million or something that he has to pay back to this company. You know, Mike, you're 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 actively involved in the minor leagues, you know, with these with these up and coming athletes. I would just like your take on this first and then I'd like to hear if Tom what Tom has to say about it as well. Uh, you know, I think that uh, you know, from from the amateur side and moving into the minor league guys, I mean, that's to me that sounds a little bit of an advisor issue right there um you know i think agents play a big part of that um you know my you know my thing is, is to the the people that are handling you and and I, I hate using the word handling but handling your affairs um you know i you have to almost wonder he's a pretty young player um you know a lot of limelight a lot of money um i think maybe in that situation it could have been the here and now when he saw the 17 18 like yeah. you said and you know, didn't compute, you know, I think with, with Tatis Jr., I think the 23 million is the four of us sit here and, 
<laughs> you know, think about that's a lot of money, but in the long run for him, yeah. um, the length of his career, the, the next contract he's going to sign, um, that could just be a drop in the bucket to him um, when it comes down. Yeah, to that's it. true. Uh, Tom, I wasn't aware. I wasn't Tom, aware. I was wondering. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tom, I was wondering why that wasn't a bigger story, to be honest, like a company like this that's been taking advantage. And I guess this isn't the first time they've done it. Uh, apparently, Tatis is obviously their biggest home run score. But, you know, was this was this not as big of, of a story as you might have expected it to be? Uh, I, I think it definitely went under the radar a little bit just because of the magnitude uh, in, in terms of what Tatis' deal ultimately was. Um, it's not really surprising yeah. for me because I think uh, – with uh, Latin players, Tatis, of course, being like being from the Dominican Republic, uh, you got to think these guys like grow up in, in extreme poverty, right? So, mm -hmm. for an opportunity to all of a sudden, uh, as a team, to take you know whether it's a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars or whatever it is, and to help your family and to help your community, um, it just it's just incredibly poor countries. I mean, it, it is this you know the sport of baseball is so popular in, in Central America and South America, because, it, you know, you can make a bat out of anything and a ball out of anything. That's, that's all you really need to yeah. do. So for, I think you, there's something definitely admirable about a guy like Tatis being able to take some of that money. Uh, I don't know what he ultimately did with it, but I, I think that the, the mindset is definitely there that, Hey, there's no guarantees in life. If somebody is offering me a couple million bucks right now, even though my dad was a former big leaguer and the pedigree is there and the talent is obviously there, uh, an injury can derail or possibly end your career at any given time. So I, I don't think athletes should ever really turn down guaranteed money, right? Especially in, in yeah. that sum. Absolutely. All right, guys, now we're going to get into what everybody wants to talk about. We're going to get into the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, I know there's a lot up here in the Sioux, obviously. So, Tom, it's going to be great to kind of get your opinion on a lot of this. And, Mike, you're going to have a unique um, a unique perspective on this as well. So um, I'm just going to start off. I want to ask about expectations. You know, Tom, let's start with you on this. You know, ex you, you, you watch the news, and a lot of people are getting kind of full of the hype here. And one thing I wanted to mention was if you were to take uh, the, the the nine starters this year, position players who we all think are going to be the starters, the average major league experience is 2.13 years, which is one, which is I think the second youngest major leagues, George Springer and Simeon are their two oldest players or that have the longest amount of major league time. So, is it realistic for people to expect this team to compete for a playoff spot and potentially a, um, an uh, American League division title? Absolutely it is. I mean, uh, the work that was put into this team in the offseason uh, in getting not only one of the best outfielders, but one of the best major leaguers, period, in George Springer uh, really uh, raised the on-field talent and, and just the – the what uh, executives and other teams and other fans think of the Blue Jays around the league. You add in an AL MVP finalist from 2019 and Marcus Simeon to the mix as well. And then uh, I, I think an addition that's really, and it's, it's not as shiny as like Springer or Simeon, but Kirby Yates, this guy was like arguably the best closer in baseball for a two year stretch very recently. Yeah. So he's coming off an injury, but I think big expectations right there. And I, I think another uh, acquisition that isn't getting a lot of love right now, but especially with Nate Pearson currently being out because of a mild groin strain and not projected to start opening day is Steven Matz. He's been sensational during the spring, uh, hasn't allowed a run over six innings, uh, striking out a batter per inning. He's a guy that uh, uh, is looking to rebound. Uh, he, he was getting thrown in uh, with the same names like Noah Syndergaard, Jacob deGrom, uh, Matt Harvey when he was coming up in the New York Mets system. So that's a guy that I really like. But when it comes down to it, uh, I think you're looking at a ball club that's projected to win around uh, 90 games. I don't know if they're right there with the news, but 
I think they're going to be able to challenge for a uh, for a wild card spot. But there's a lot of good teams, and a, a, a lot of people are are sleeping on the Tampa Bay Rays because they lost Blake Snell and Charlie mm-hmm. Morton. That team always get the best out of their players. They just turn water into wine, and I, I wouldn't write off the Rays. And the Red Sox look like they have a, a, a good uh, lineup as well. Pitching is the the big question mark for them. And uh, Baltimore, I mean, they're awful, but they got really good prospects coming up. Adley Rutschman, a former first overall pick, and, and they have a bunch of other guys. And before you know it, Baltimore is going to be right there in the equation as well. So the AL East is as tough as ever. I think it's the second best division in all of baseball outside of the AL East. So. Yeah. You work a lot with pitchers. There's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the pitching staff this year and why haven't the Jays kind of gone out and addressed the pitching situation a little more thoroughly. So, uh, Mike, can you just m- talk about the pitching staff and kind of what you think about them? Um, is there room for improvement? Those types of things. Sure, yeah. No, I, I, I mean, you know, piggyback on what Tom said, I mean, I, I think the excitement, you know, um, that you guys talked about um, the fan base and what they're doing. And I, I think they're, I think it's sincere excitement as well. Uh, you know, when it comes to pitching, um, you know, I am a pitching guy and a manager, but, you know, I think pitching and defense does still win championships. You know, I know it's the age of the home run ball and, and the fans yeah. with that. I think for the Jays to be successful is finding a consistent, and it's going to sound funny, two, three, four, and five guy. Um, yeah. you know, behind Ryu. Um, I think if they can solidify, you know, Matt's stay consistent, you know, two, three years ago, he was lights out with the Mets, you know, last year was very average. Um, and I think it's wide open to be honest with you for the three, four, five spots. I think guys like, you know, you see Roark, um, you know, getting some innings, his stuff's down a little bit. Um, you know, I think Ross Stripling's, a quality arm out of the, you know, he can be a swing guy. You know, I think he can start and relieve. Uh, I know he's listed there, but, you know, I think he's quietly, you know, going to put together some quality innings. And, and and for me, I know he didn't have a great outing the other day or today was, is Anthony K. Um, you know, I got to see him a lot in Buffalo just as a fan going over the border and watching him pitch. Um, you know, I think he can turn into a back end of the starting rotation to give you enough serviceable innings to, you know, as Tom said, to compete against the Yankees, the Rays, you know, the Orioles, the Red Sox, um, to go from there. But I do believe it's going to come down to their rotation. I think their bullpen, you know, by getting Yates, um, you know, is going to be strong. I think, you know, again, bias-wise, Jordan Romano did pitch in our organization as a high schooler. So, you know, I've got a soft spot mm-hmm. for Jordan. And, uh, you know, the last couple of years, you know, he's done some things to – you know, to, to up the slider, um, you know, the fastball, you know, strength wise, you know, he throws it better than anybody. So I think he's a, I think he's a guy that could be anywhere from seven, eight, nine, you know, and I think if they can get three guys that can handle those innings, um, you know, I think he can piece together, you know, six, seven, five, six, seven. Um, I'm just interested to see how many innings consistently can our starters or the Jays starters, you know, pitch into the fifth, pitch into the sixth inning. Um, and I don't have the stats, Tom, you would probably know this more than that, but I think last year, a couple of times when they ran into problems, starters weren't going deep enough in, uh, in games. So that'll be to me where two, three, four, five come into play. So and yeah, Tom. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, I was you just going to touch. Yeah, I was just going to touch on that. Um, and I, I think that you saw this, obviously, in the uh, pandemic shortened season that uh, a lot of starters weren't throwing as many innings a- as usual. And obviously, that weird restart with spring training 2.0 was a result of that. And you did see a lot of uh, guys going down with injuries, which is problematic. So I, I think because with pitchers uh they're so fickle and they're creatures of habit and and they build up their arm strength and stamina throughout spring training and obviously the big guys the front end starters are are coming off usually 200 plus inning seasons and and you're not going to see that so i think 
it, to begin uh, 2021 uh, for the first month or two, you're going to see a lot of teams go with six man rotations and you're going to see middle relievers and long guys have more integral roles than in previous years. So, so Tom, this is one thing I want really wanted to ask you, because if there's one player that I've been enamored with for the past few seasons, and this is because I'm a, you know, baseball is weird for me. You know, like I'm a diehard in Detroit Lions fan for football. You know, I'm a diehard Chicago Blackhawks fan. But when it comes to baseball, I love the Jays, Tigers, and Cubs. All three of them. Just love them. So I've been following Robbie Ray's career for since he was in the minors with Detroit. For a guy that, you know, after he left Detroit, he had a lot of success or had some success, we'll say, but he's kind of tapered off over the last few years. In your opinion, what's going on with Robbie Ray? And do you think he can be a contributing member to the Jays this year? Because I think he, I think if he has a half decent season, he could be that guy for us. Yeah, Robbie Ray is one of two X factors for me this season for the Jays, Nate Pearson being the other, but Robbie Ray at one point when he was pitching for the D-backs was mm -hmm. considered one of the best lefties in the National League. Mm -hmm. uh, he has great uh, strikeout numbers, uh, a big uh, K per nine ratio guy. And so far, just like Matt's, he's looked really good during the spring. He was touching 98 on the radar gun the other day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think with him, he was a victim to, again, just a weird pandemic uh shortened season uh I, I don't think he had the proper time to build up and he, he was getting hit around like crazy at first I, I think he had an era like over nine after yeah. his first like five or six starts for a guy that was uh maybe a year uh two years ago uh w w considered one of the best trade candidates when when he was an all-star hurler with arizona so if if he rediscover some of that magic uh we you know we're talking about what sort of guy is going to step up and be that number two behind Hinjin Ryu and will the Jays have to go out and acquire a guy like that hey Robbie Ray he, he's an in-house option that if he pitches like we know Robbie Ray can pitch uh that solves a lot of problems for Toronto last question about Robbie Ray I've always wondered this too especially now and especially that now that he's touching 98 what are your thoughts on moving him to the bullpen? Uh, I, I mean, I think the Jays have a lot of guys in the bullpen that can yeah. that throw heat and have big strikeout numbers. Uh, you touched on uh, Jordan Romano. I, I love him. Honestly, if Kirby Yates didn't come to town, I thought Jordan Romano uh, yeah. had the makings of a fine closer. So, and, and that's who, who's, you know, to say that that isn't in Romano's, uh, you know, not so distant future, right? Kirby Yates is already 33, is on a one-year yep. contract. That's it. If he has a sensational year, Yates could leave town just like that. So yeah. I, I think Jordan Romano still could be a, a closer of the future. And with Ray, I know the Jays last year kind of used him as an opener at times. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the goal is to stretch him out and and see what he can do. And they resigned him for eight million uh, for one season. I mean, if he yeah. gives you uh, 150 innings with a sub four ERA, uh, strikes out uh, a batter plus per inning. I mean, the Jays are laughing, right? That's right. Yeah. All right, so we got a couple questions here from the audience. So the first one involves Pearson. Obviously, Pearson's a big name for the Jays, and his expectations are through the roof. If I were to place the over under, over under on innings pitched for Pearson this year at 120, 120 innings, what would you say? I would say under because he pitched 17 innings last season. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. And and yeah, and, and he's 24, and the Jays would be crazy trying to push him and his arm. And Pearson has had some unfortunate injuries, so he's had. Uh, uh, trouble staying on the field so far. So, I mean, in terms of a guy whose ceiling is a legit future ace, uh, yeah, you got to you gotta move him along slowly. It, I, yeah, I would agree. I mean, he hasn't experienced either, Tom. Has he the 162-game full, you know, yeah. big league season? So, you know, I think he's a guy that um, when Tom talked about six-man rotation, if they go to that, I mean, obviously he would benefit from that. But, you know, I think – He's someone they're going to be very delicate with in terms of giving them extra days, 
between starts if he needs it. Um, I don't know if they'll put a cap on him, but I, I think they'll they'll stretch him out through the year. But I think he could be an extra rest day for sure, um, just because of the longevity he's not used to. Yeah, no, that's good. Another question here: What are the ch- and I can I never know how to pronounce his name if it's Groshans or Groshans. How would you pronounce Jordan? Uh, Groshans, what is it? Yeah. What are the chances of yeah. uh, Austin Martin or Groshans making their major league debut this summer? You want to go first on this one? <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go first. Um, obviously, I mean, you know, both quality guys. I mean, you know, Martin's is the you know number twenty-two on the prospect list. I think last time I looked, and you know, super athletic, um, and I just I don't see it. You know, they have him as a twenty twenty-two projection coming in um i think they're gonna hold off on him um let him get his feet wet i mean i know he's coming out of vanderbilt and you know it's you know the vanderbilt program's almost like a minor league program the way they produce players and mm-hmm. and put players into pro baseball so in terms of a maturity standpoint i think he's there but i think i just tom i just i just don't know if there's room for them i i agree i don't i don't think there's a reason to rush either of these guys right i uh, you've got young studs uh, in the outfields, in the infield, and unless there's a devastating long-term injury or one of those guys is just an absolute house on fire and you have no other option, but why burn a year for their service time anyways? Yeah, it, it makes right. no sense. The, the Jays have strategically uh, built this team and their farm system for waves of talent. We're talking about sustainable success here. And Mark Shapiro said it best the other day, uh, this is not a championship season. This is a championship era. The Jays want to be like the Dodgers. They want to have this title window of five to seven years. So, and, and, and that's the best part and that's what they've done. So I, I would be quite surprised to see either one of those guys, um, up with the big league club this year. So obviously George Springer was a big signing this year for the Jays. And, you know, obviously with the history of the Astros and the cheating scandal and those types of things. And we got a question here from Dan Stark. You know, how will Springer do in the locker room given his history? Now, we all know that, you know, we've all heard the stories that Springer is one of the best locker room guys you can get. Do you think that he's going to need to address this before the season? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Springer already talked about it. Uh, I also believe that, uh, yeah, maybe questions are still going to be lingering about this, but uh, I think this is an issue that is is kind of behind everybody. Uh, I think uh, George Springer already came out and said what he needs to, to say. Uh, I, I don't think that you need to pick at the scab anymore, even if there is a scab. Um, this guy is a, a proven winner. Um, and I, I know that some may say that the championship and 2017 was tainted, but he was a really good player after that uh, when uh, the Astros were no longer stealing signs. So I I don't think there should be any sort of issues with uh, George Springer. And when during his introductory press conference, uh, he touched on it. And honestly, I I think it's something that's already water under the bridge. Fair enough. So, Mike, I want to go to you first on this question. We, you know, obviously everyone knows about. Uh, Guerrero and BGO and the young talent that the Jays have. You know, I kind of almost got the impression throughout the last year that Guerrero is almost like the man without a position. And, you know, where's Guerrero? What's his future going to look like? And, you know, BGO almost to the same extent. Just over, what are your thoughts on that? Where do you think both players are best suited to play? And then we'll go to Tom for the same question. Uh, you know, for me personally, I think with Guerrero and, and I've only seen, you know, handfuls of snippets of highlights and, and watched the opener a little bit with them, but just the, the body change that he came in with, um, mm-hmm. I think, to be honest with you, in my mind, is going to allow him to play both corners. Um, I think he could play third base if needed to. Um, obviously, he showed he can play over at first base. So, you know, I, I think the just the off season he had is going to allow him to move back and forth. Um, and I think you might see him do that. Um, when you talked about Biggio too, I mean, to me, Kevin Biggio is kind of a Swiss army knife. You know, he can play third, he can play second, you know, you've seen him in the outfield. Um, 
you know, I think he could play both corners in the outfield. So, you know, again, you know, and locked in, I think that's one great thing about the young guys, even with, um, you know, with Bichette and, you know, Simeon coming over, I think you have, you know, three or four, three, three movable infielders, you know, at the two skill spots, if you need it. And, you know, going from there, I don't know what their bench would look like. Uh, you know, Tom's yeah. I know, you know, panics, you know, coming on a storm last couple of days and whether he makes it or not, but um, I do, I, I think, I think you'll see Bezio all over the diamond if you ask me. Yep. Tom. Yeah. I think the key word here is uh, versatility and uh, fluidness. The Jays, they like their athletes. They like guys. They don't really have to find positions. And, and I think that's really important. I, I think that's, you're talking about a modern baseball player right there. And the fact that Kevin Biggio can go out and play first, second, third, mm -hmm. or man one of the corner positions, even play in center. I mean, that's incredible. Like what an unbelievable skill set. And for Vladdy to even get 30 to 35 starts at third base is just going to be a bonus. If, if Vladdy plays average defense at first and third, and crushes the baseball like we've ex like we have been expecting him to do that that's just a win right there for the team yeah. so yeah so guy a guy like rowdy telez one of my favorite players on the team i just i love everything about the guy i love the way he carries himself i love his bat but, but you know more specifically a dh player is he a guy that you picture being around long term with the jays um, we'll go with Tom to this one. Do you see him being around long term for the Jays, or do you think he might be baited as kind of like a, a, a trade chip to try and upgrade the pitching throughout the season? I think uh, a lot of it is going to depend on how Vladdy uh, manages in mm -hmm. at third, and then if he can actually progress at first as well. It would be a shame to end up with a 22 year old DH. But Rowdy Telez is still only 25 years old, and he's basically a, a first base slash DH. So, yeah, exactly. and the thing is about Rowdy, I, I think he's really coming into his own. Um, he, he wasn't uh, the most hyped prospect in the Blue Jays system. Definitely didn't get the attention like uh, Biggio, Bichette, or Guerrero did. But I, this guy's got Herculean power, and he's yeah. he's only getting better. I, I really feel that it was obviously a small sample size in 2020, but he ended up the, the season with like an 860 OPS or something like that. So he's really coming into his own. It's just all about finding a, like at bats for him in, our, in just a loaded Jays lineup. Uh, would he be a trade chip? I I mean, maybe. The thing is, like, first basemen are are not as um, desirable yeah. like they used to be, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> in terms of uh, prospects and, and younger players that are really catching a lot of attention, obviously pitchers, shortstops, center fielders, guys that really uh, ha have much more influence on the game uh, defensively than a first baseman, but Rowdy's power is definitely going to keep him in the equation and the conversation throughout the season. Absolutely. All right. We're going to wrap this up here in the next couple of minutes. Cause I know we're keeping you guys for long, but I could talk to you guys all night about this stuff. I love this. So we'll, we'll start great. with you. Yeah, We'll start with you, Mike. I want to give you a quick second to kind of talk about the program. You know, you mentioned that there's uh, I think you said seven, players in camps right now that that you that you directly had a hand in working with um can you just kind of talk about the program where baseball canada is heading um obviously we're heading in a pretty good direction and just some of the prospects that are coming up and then tom if you know about any of these players and you have anything you'd like to add please chime in as well uh yeah sure um you know it's you know the shameless plug for the ontario blue jays who i work for but uh you know i'm fortunate we're one of the top you know amateur organizations in the country um, and it's been around, you know, for 25 years, I've been with the organization for seven directly. Um, and this year we have, as I said, seven guys, we have, uh, you know, obviously Jordan Romano in camp with the Jays and on the, in the roster, Jordan Belzovic, you know, is with the Minnesota twins in big league camp. Zach pop, um, is with the Marlins now. Um, you know, uh, it there, Bo and Noah, uh, Josh Naylor with the Indians, you know, that's a yeah. pretty neat story. You know, two brothers, Noah's, uh, or they call him Bo, it's Noah. Um, you know, he's only in his second or second full year of pro baseball, you know, and he's up at big league camp with his brother. And then two Tigers guys, uh, Daniel Pinero, uh, who's University of Virginia, uh, uh, draft pick out of there. And then Jacob Robson, 
uh, who's played for us, the Windsor guys with the Tigers as well. So, um, you know, that's exciting when, you know, we see our guys and pushing through and, you know, we think, you know, both Pop and Balzovic were on the cusp. Um, you know, the Twins pitching, they were picking up Hap, I believe, and, you know, they loaded up. Uh, we thought he might have a chance as he's one of their top two pitching prospects in the organization. Um, and then Pop being taken in the Rule 5, um, you know, he's uh, he's got a chance at the back end of the Marlins bullpen, possibly. Um, so we'll see what happens there. And then Josh, you know, Josh should be a mainstay in the Indians lineup, uh, I think. I don't know if they're going to keep him in the outfield. They put him back at first base a little bit. So, um, you know, we'll see where that goes. Um, you know, in terms of Baseball Canada, again, it's been tough on Greg Hamilton, who runs our national teams um, with the national program. But, uh, you know, there, I mentioned it earlier, uh, Bono talking to you, there's two – you know, two quality high school arms uh, this year. Calvin yeah. Ziegler's one of them. Um, you know, he's out of the London area, big right-handed pitcher. Um, you know, he'll run it up there, you know, 94, 96, can spin it. Big body kid. He's an Auburn commit. Um, so, we'll, you know, we'll see what the spring unfolds for him leading up to the – with the draft being a little later this year. You know, I, I think it'll help, you know, help some guys get a look on him, even with the 20 rounds. And then Mitch Bratt is a left-hander out of uh, – the Toronto area, who's a Florida State commit, um, you know, another, you know, quality guy. Um, personally, it could be more of a college sign uh, if he ends up on Florida State's campus. Uh, but those, to me, are the two. Those are the two big names in, in um, from the Canadian side, amateur wise. That's awesome, Tom. You know anything about these uh, these young Canadian kids? And, and just talk about what your expectations or or uh, you know kind of thoughts are about these guys. Yeah, uh, one guy obviously that really uh, stands out is uh, Josh Naylor. I think he has a tremendous opportunity with the Cleveland Indians to be an everyday major leaguer. Uh, that team has desperately needed outfield help for uh, a few years now, and he's going to get that opportunity. Uh, the San Diego Padres, they have a loaded farm system, and they've developed a ton of talent. So uh, Naylor obviously uh, was drafted by San Diego and and now with the Indians. Um Excited to see what his brother can do as well. Uh, so tremendous opportunity right there. Um, but yeah, those are Josh Naylor is probably the guy that I'm most intrigued by uh, this year, just because he is going to have uh, an opportunity to be an impact player. All right, Mike. So before we let you guys go, I got to ask two questions. The first one is going to be this. I want you to name a pitcher and a player for the Blue Jays that you think is going to be vital to the team this year? Who needs to be, you know, who really needs to step up in terms of a positional player and who really needs to step up in terms of a pitcher for this team to be successful? Uh, Don't okay. say Jordan Romano. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Obviously, I have to. Probably tear, tear me up if yeah. I don't say that. Other than me loving Jordan. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and, and, and say Ryan Barecki, you know, as a left-hander out of the pen, you know, and, and I don't really know what kind of role that would be, whether it would be short. I know gone are the days of the, the specialists with the new rules and the three batter stuff, but I think he's going to be key out of the bullpen, uh, you know, for him. And then from a position player standpoint, uh, man. I know it's a tough question, putting you on the spot. Uh, it's 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 not even that. It's, I don't even know, you know, where to start. I think there's a lot of key guys. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I guess I'm going to go with Duriel. You know, I, I just you know maintaining some consistency and putting together, you know, runs of good at bats, more so production too. Um, those would be my guys right there. Tom, nice. Uh, two guys for me that are going to elevate this team from a good team to a potentially great team is Robbie Ray rediscovering his all-star form yes. because the, the biggest glaring hole right now for me uh, is the team not having a number two behind Hinch and Ryu. It's basically Ryu and a, bottle, a bunch of middle of the rotation back end guys. So that's going to be really important. And then in terms of position players, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. I mean, <laughs> the, this guy was like considered the greatest hitting prospect of all time. He profiled yeah. to be 
a mashup of Manny Ramirez meets Miguel Cabrera meets Frank Thomas. And in two seasons, uh, he's got an OPS of like you know, 780. I mean, it's really good for someone who's who started playing in the big leagues at the age of 20. But big things were expected from Vladdy, and he takes this offense to another level if he finds and, and discovers uh, the hitting abilities that, that we all know are obviously uh, in him, right? Mike, what's your prediction for the Blue Jays this season? Uh, my prediction, I think they're going to finish second. That's my prediction in the East. Do they get a wild card spot? They do get a wild card spot. Do you think they win a playoff series this year? Are they ready to take that? Uh, I think it's going to piggyback on what Tom said. I think if yeah. they solidify a 2-3 spot by the playoff time, they got a chance. Tom? Yeah, I uh, think they uh, finished second behind the Yankees. Um, and they are going to grab a wild card spot. A uh, big difference between this season and last. There's no expanded uh, playoffs. So it's going to be much more difficult, obviously. Um, once they get there, uh, they could be facing a division winner. So it could be uh, the Yankees. It could be the White Sox. Or it could be the Houston Astros, Oakland Athletics. So it'll be tough. I think uh, the Jays still got to go out at the trade deadline and get a co-ace to pair with Hinge and Ryu for this team to really be considered a World Series contender. And this is just a yes or no answer from both of you. And I know there's going to be a million reasons why you answer this, but it might be tough. But this is a yes or no question. Can the Blue Jays be playoff contenders with Hernandez and Gurriel as everyday players in the outfield. Yeah, absolutely. Tom. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Teoscar Hernandez had a better season than Mike Trout last year. And, no, no, yeah. Lourdes, and, and Lourdes Goriel Jr. is uh, almost a career 300 batter. And uh, I, I think he's improved significantly in the outfield. I mean, I think uh, Goriel was uh, nominated for a gold glove, if I'm not mistaken. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, and Mike? That's a yes for me, too. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I'll tell you this. I'm a diehard Cubs fan, as I mentioned earlier. And one of the greatest <laughs> things I ever did in my life was going down to Cleveland for Game 7 when the Cubs won the World Series. And nice. quite the story about how I got in there and, and you know, just with it buying a scalp ticket in the seventh inning for ridiculous money. But getting to see that was unbelievable. That's incredible. And the reason I bring that up is because I see – a lot of similarities between that Cubs team and this Jays team, minus the fact that they're pit, that they don't have that established number pitcher. Tom, do you see a connection there? Yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully uh, the Blue Jays don't become what the Chicago Cubs are today no. after <laughs> winning the World yeah. Series. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, you've got those really high ceiling position players. And I, I do kind of see the similarity of when the Cubs went out and got John Lester to exactly. when the Jays got Ryu, uh, yeah. uh, a lefty ace. And so I, I think so. But the problem is, like, championship windows can close like that. Like, the Houston Astros were supposed to win three, four championships. The Chicago Cubs were supposed to win three, four championships. So if you can even nail down one, uh, you got to go for it. But yeah, you, you know what? I, I definitely see some uh, some comparisons between the two. So la this is, really is the last question. <laughs> will the Blue Jays win? Will the Blue Jays win a World Series in the next five years? Yes. 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 Mike? <laughs> yeah, yes. It's, oh, that's it's, awesome. <laughs> well, that's great. Listen, guys, I can't thank you enough. Like I said, you, we've been on here for for an hour we could talk for a few minutes to another hour i bet but you know we're really fortunate that you guys both took time out of your busy schedules to join us here today um you know obviously tom this is uh this is kind of a step down from what you're used to so <laughs> we really do we really do appreciate it and uh hopefully guys if you guys don't mind maybe we base a couple months into this season and do a little 20 minutes 
an update if that'd be cool the kind of the jays are going because sure. i've gotten quite quite a few text messages on here already saying that uh, people really enjoyed what you guys had to say in your take so we really appreciate it thank you very very much yeah fantastic appreciate it guys thanks, thanks for having thanks, me guys yeah thanks tom